In the early morning hours of November 20th, 1969, a group of Native Americans that called themselves Indians of all tribes departed to Alcatraz Island in the San Francisco Bay. The island that served as a prison was now uninhabited. The natives bypassed a Coast Guard blockade and took control of the island. The 19-month takeover that followed would be regarded as one of the greatest acts of political resistance in Native American history. Before the coming of European explorers, about 10,000 indigenous people called Ohlone lived in the San Francisco Bay Area, north and south of it. The Ohlone people lived here thousands of years before Europeans arrived. They lived in around 50 groups and did not view themselves as a single unified group. They were hunter-gatherers and fishermen. Alcatraz Island was an important transport hub for them and a food-gathering site because eggs from birds were collected on the island, as well fishing off its shores was common. The island was also used as a ceremonial site and to isolate community members who violated tribal laws. The takeover of Alcatraz we are going to talk about is not the first one. In 1963, Belva Cotier, a Sioux social worker living in the San Francisco Bay Area, read an article that the Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary was closing and the property was to be given to the city of San Francisco. Remembering the 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie, which stated that unused federal land is to be given back to Native Americans, she and Richard McKenzie took a copy of the treaty and proposed that if the property was surplus land of the government, the Sioux people could claim it. On March 8, 1964, a small group of Sioux demonstrated by taking over the island for four hours. The entire party consisted of about 40 people, including the lawyer representing those claiming land stakes, as they filed a court action to obtain title to the island prior to the demonstration. They were soon taken back by the Coast Guard. This short takeover is significant because the participants demanded the use of the island for a cultural center and a Native American university. These demands would resurface in the takeover of 1969. Bay Area natives were organizing another takeover of Alcatraz for years. And when the news came that the city wants to sell the island to a billionaire developer, they decided it's time for action. In a time when the country was taken with civil rights movements, student protests, and new worldviews. On November 9th, 1969, Richard Oakes and a group of supporters set out to symbolically claim Alcatraz Island for the Native American people. The demands of the occupation were almost identical to those made in 1964 by the Sioux who had claimed the island. Five boats were organized to take approximately 75 native people to the island, but none of the boats came. They then boarded a boat named the Monte Cristo and convinced the captain to make a turn around the island. When they came close to Alcatraz, Richard Oakes, Jim Vaughn, Joe Bill, Ross Hardin, and Jerry Hatch jumped overboard and tried to swim to the island. The Coast Guard soon picked them up and the whole action was portrayed in the media as a publicity stunt. Later that day, a bigger group, led by Richard Oakes and Lenata Warjack, then Lenata Means, departed from Fisherman's Wharf. They arrived on the island and 14 of them stayed the night. The next day, Richard Oakes gave a speech now known as the Alcatraz Proclamation. We, uh, the Native Americans, reclaim this land known as Alcatraz Island in the name of all American Indians by right of discovery. We wish to be fair and honorable in our dealings with the Caucasian inhabitants of this land and hereby offer the following treaty. We will purchase said Alcatraz Island for $24 in glass beads and red cloth, a precedent set by the white man's purchase of a similar island about 300 years ago. We know that $24 in trade goods for these 16 acres is more than was paid when Manhattan Island was sold, but we know that land values have risen over the years. Our offer of $1.24 per acre is greater than 47 cents per acre the white man is now paying the California Indians for their land. <clears throat> we will give to the inhabitants of this island a portion of that land for their own to be held in trust by the American Indian government. For as long as the sun shall rise and the rivers go down to the sea, to be administered by the Bureau of Caucasian Affairs. Oaks then made a deal with authorities in which the natives would abandon the island and not be arrested. When they came back ashore, they decided they are going to try again, this time with better organization. On the night of November 20th, 1969, this symbolic takeover turned into a full-scale demonstration when 89 Native Americans boarded boats 30 miles south of San Francisco and landed on Alcatraz Island, most of them university students with some of them being women and children. The 89 protesters took over the island, 
stating that the 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie required that unused federal land be given back to Native Americans. In no time, the natives began to organize with Richard Oakes serving as the unofficial mayor of Alcatraz, electing a council and providing for security, sanitation, daycare, school, and housing. The protesters specifically cited their treatment under the Indian termination policy, and they accused the government of breaking numerous treaties. Although she was not very recognized in the media and mainstream at the time, Lenata Warjack was one of the leaders of the takeover, arriving the first day and leaving amongst the last. She wrote speeches in which she stated that the protesters wanted complete native control over the island by rights of the Treaty of Fort Laramie. Warjack's proposal was a native center which would include full-time native consultants, teachers, librarians, and staff leading people around telling the story of Indians of all tribes. Richard Oakes sent a message to the San Francisco Department of the Interior saying, We invite the United States to acknowledge the justice of our claim. The choice now lies with the leaders of the American government. To use violence upon us as before to remove us from our great spirit's land, or to institute a real change in its dealing with the American Indian. We do not fear your threat to charge us with crimes on our land. We and all other oppressed people would welcome spectacle of proof before the world of your title by genocide. Nevertheless, we seek peace. Initially, government negotiators insisted that the protesters leave the island, but that changed soon. The government adopted a position of non-interference. This position was taken largely due to strong public support for the Native Americans and their demands. I think we had to sell it for twenty-four dollars worth of beads. For the Indian. If they want it, they should have it. Why do you feel that? Because I'm for the Indians. What do you think we ought to do with it? Let him have it. Why? I like the Indians. Well, it seems to me it's a it's a good place for an Indian tribe. The Indians have a, a long history of taking very good care of the land when when they uh, when they owned and controlled the United States. Uh, you know, there were plenty of uh, fish in the rivers and birds in the sky. Advocates from show business celebrities to the Hells Angels supported the takeover, and federal officials began to meet with the natives. Supplies had to be brought to the island, with the Coast Guard's blockades making this increasingly difficult. People brought their families with kids. In the first days of the protests, there was around 150 people at the island, but at the height of the takeover, there were around 400 people on Alcatraz. Arriving Thanksgiving, the strong support for the natives continued with people in restaurants donating food. The man who would soon become the voice of Alcatraz, John Trudell, started daily radio broadcasts from the island in December of 1969, naming it Radio Free Alcatraz. Also, in January of 1970, protesters began publishing a newsletter. Being pressed by the support for native protesters, the government didn't use force to remove them. In fact, in November, the government provided water for the island and government officials, often sitting cross-legged on blankets inside the old mess hall, discussed the social needs of Native Americans. At one point, the government offered a portion of Fort Miley in San Francisco as an alternative site to Alcatraz. But by this time, the natives were too dedicated to their cause, refusing any alternatives. Numerous famous people supported the protest. Jane Fonda, Anthony Quinn, Marlon Brando, Jonathan Winters, Buffy St. Marie, and Dick Gregory visited the island to show their support. The band Credence Clearwater Revival supported the takeover with a $15,000 donation that was used to buy a boat, named the Clearwater, for transport to the island. Support also came from the American Indian Movement, the Black Panthers, Brown Berets, and the Asian and white community. Around New Year of 1970, many Native students returned to school being replaced with natives who came from all over the country. At the same time, many non-natives came to the island, with many of them being members of the San Francisco hippie and drug culture. Despite an initial no drugs and alcohol on the island policy, some of the new protesters didn't hold on to that agreement. It's also said that one of the problems was a power struggle between two groups who wanted leadership. Tragedy occurred on January 3, 1970, 12-year-old Yvonne Oakes, daughter of Annie and Richard Oakes, fell from the third floor of an stairway and died. After that, the Oakes family left the island, saying they did not have the heart for it anymore. With Oakes gone, Lenata Warjack, John Trudell, Stella Leach, 
and Al Miller stepped up in the organization and negotiations with the federal government. Soon the government decided they are not going to allow a university and community center on the island, making a counteroffer of turning the island into a Native American-themed park. When the natives declined, the government decided to make the island a national park. The natives declined again. In response, the government shut off all electrical power and removed the water barge, which provided fresh water for those on the island, facing the protesters with lack of resources. Immediately, people started transporting water and generators to the island. Once again, support from the people on land was strong. Three days after the removal of the water barge, on June 1, 1970, a fire started and raged through several of the buildings. When the fire died out, the warden's home, the lighthouse keeper's residence, and the officer's club were burned to the ground. Also, the historic lighthouse built in 1854 was severely damaged. The government blamed the natives, and the natives blamed undercover government infiltrators trying to turn public support against them. The cause of the fire is unknown. Despite all that, public support for natives remained high. People gathered across the country, protested, and continued to send supplies to those on the island, demanding bigger rights for Native American people. As 1970 came to an end, Natives and the government continued to negotiate. In January of 1971, two oil tankers collided in the San Francisco Bay. There were stories of protesters stripping copper from the island and selling it to buy supplies. There was also talk of physical assaults. After that, the media began to lose interest in the cause with public support also declining. This pushed the federal government into action and a removal plan began to develop. As time passed, the plan of removal with as little force as possible, and at a time that the smallest number of people were on the island, took place on June 11, 1971. On that day, 20 armed federal marshals, assisted by the Coast Guard, swarmed the island, removing five women, four children, and six unarmed Native men. After 19 months, the takeover of Alcatraz was over. Although the demands of the natives were not realized, the American public was now awakened and informed about the Native American plight and their problems. The takeover of Alcatraz resulted in the ending of the Indian termination policy. A policy of Native self-determination became the official U.S. government policy. During the period the protesters were on Alcatraz, President Nixon returned Blue Lake and 48,000 acres of land to the Taos Natives. Lands near Davis in California would become home to a Native American university. The Bureau of Indian Affairs in Washington, D.C. would begin hiring Native Americans to work in the federal agency that had a big effect on their lives. The takeover of Alcatraz also launched a wave of protests across America for Native American rights. Alcatraz was opened in 1973 as a national park. With memorials on the island, the takeover was immortalized in the history of Alcatraz. Every year on November 20th, Native Americans returned to Alcatraz to celebrate the takeover. 